Thank you for watching the forum for the two candidates uh, for the Ward 5 Tupelo City Council race. My name is Taylor Vance, and I'm the local government reporter for the Daily Journal. Today, we have two of the three Ward 5 candidates with us. We have Buddy Palmer, the incumbent member of the council who is seeking re-election as a Republican. And we have uh, one of the challengers in this race, Hannah Meharry, who is running as a Democrat. Cecil Glenn Neighbors, the independent candidate in this race, did not attend the forum. Uh, let me establish a few ground rules for the forum. Uh, each of you will get a two-minute opening statement at the beginning. I will then ask a series of questions to each of you, and you will have one minute to answer those questions. Um, at the end, you will have a two-minute closing statement. If at any time during the forum uh, one of you criticizes your opponent, the opponent will have 30 seconds uh, to address that critique. Are there any questions? All right, we will move on to the opening statements. We will go in alphabetical order, so we will start with Ms. Meharry. Ms. Meharry, Ms. Meharry, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Hello, my name is Hannah Meharry. I am running for Tupelo City Council in Ward 5. I am, was born and raised here in Tupelo and has have graduated from Tupelo High School, went uh, locally to Ole Miss, and then after that I, I explored my opportunities with the United States Peace Corps and served overseas for two years in Mongolia. Um, when I came back from Peace Corps, I applied for a scholarship with the University of New Orleans and was accepted into their Master's of Public Administration program. Uh, public Administration Administration is basically the study of how to implement federal and local funding to benefit the community. And then since I moved home to Tupelo, um, I have been a grant administrator and now a public administrator of a homeless 71 county homeless coalition focused on addressing homelessness and moving homeless individuals into housing. Um, my platform includes three goals. Those goals are, of course, to focus on housing because I think that's an issue that affects everyone um, in Tupelo, whether they under whether they recognize it or not. Also, I'd like to focus on developing our, our job market for uh, other people my same age and for different skill sets. And then also, I'd like to focus on education. I have many people in my family that work in the education system, and I feel like coming out of COVID-19, they're going to need some additional resources to make sure that we get back on track and especially our students get back on track. So that's just an abbreviated uh, bi uh, biography of me, but I look forward to your questions, Taylor. So. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Councilman Palmer, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Yes, my name is Buddy Palmer. Uh, number one is I've lived in Tupelo all my life. I love Tupelo. I've been, I've lived in most of the wards back in uh, 57, my dad decided to look for areas for a supermarket. He went to East Tupelo, and uh, of course, our family followed. I, sw I went to um, all the schools in Tupelo, graduated from Tupelo High School, went to Mississippi State, graduated in marketing, actually advertising, and swore I'd never go into the grocery business when, in fact, as soon as I got out, I got married and uh, uh, then went into the grocery business. Uh, I served in the military uh, with the Army Reserve for six years. Uh, I am a uh, I am a common sense councilman. I think the last eight years, if you listen, like I have several times to the state of the city uh, addressed by Mayor Shelton, I don't think anyone could criticize the last eight years and what we've accomplished. We have the uh, we and we want to continue with that. And so. Uh, I've served eight years. I'd like to serve four more to continue what we've got started. And uh, like I said, what I bring to the council is I am a businessman. In my case, four plus four has to always equal eight. It can't equal nine. So I bring that to it, and I bring a lot of common sense to it. And I think that's very important to be a council person. We will now move on to the question portion, where I will ask each of you the same question. The first question is about infrastructure in Ward 5. What do you think is the most pressing infrastructure issue, if any, that exists in Ward 5? And if elected, what do you think you could do to address that issue? Infrastructure is a very important thing everywhere. But uh, in, my, in my opinion, the biggest thing that we have now is drainage. 
And uh, we've addressed that with the council. We have had a study done by Cook Coggins Engineers. And uh, there's going to be several stages of uh, trying to improve drainage in Tupelo, Mississippi. They're all going to be very expensive, but that's something we highly need. Can I speak to any other infrastructures? Uh, we have, I think we have great streets, roads. We have more money spent under this administration and, and uh, on roads, uh, you know, mill and overlay of streets. I think we've got close to $4 million to do that. The thing is, we have to contract all of that out and requires a lot of things. Availability is number one. Number two is, uh, is to, you have to have good weather. And so we're doing that. And, um, number three is water. Back in the years, Tupelo was wise enough and Tupelo has always been very progressive to have that one half of one percent sales tax for water coming from the ten top. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, same question to you, Hannah. Um, what do you think is the most uh, pressing infrastructure need, if any, in yeah. Ward 5, and what do you think you uh, could do about it if you're elected to the city council? Gotcha. Uh, I do agree with Mr. Palmer. We do have good roads. I mean, I lived in New Orleans for almost six years. I've lived in a, I've lived overseas in a country that's developing. I know bad roads. Tupelo does not have bad roads. Uh, there, of course, there is progress that could be made on some of our roads that do need additional development to make it easier to um, to get back and forth, to commute back and forth to school and to work. But I do think that we do have um, good road structures. I also believe that our public utilities are very solid. We know that through the last couple of winter weather and severe storm we've had, we've had consistent services compared to other areas. One uh, public, utility, uh, public utility and infrastructure that I think we need to focus on is fiber and getting more, um, more connectivity in our neighborhoods. We do not realize how important internet connection can change a child's life or can change a, a, a family's life just to have reliable access to the internet, especially since a lot of education programs have been moved online, a lot of uh, work opportunities have been moved online. We need to focus on having better quality internet service across our city and that is consistent and equitable in all households. I want to ask about services that impact low-income citizens in our community. The first question is about affordable housing, which voters have indicated to us is the most important issue they care about this election cycle. Ms. Meharry, do you think that the city has a problem with access to affordable housing, and what do you think the city can do about it going forward to address this issue? Okay. Um, thank you, Taylor. You, I, most people who know me know how seriously I take housing issues um, because homelessness in a lot of ways is caused by not being able to afford consistent housing. It's, uh, housing insecurity is caused by not being able to afford in the community in which you live. Um, I do think there's more that we could do. And I will just point out, this is not a Tupelo alone. This is not typical alone. We're seeing housing issues throughout the state. We're seeing housing issues throughout our country. Um, there have been rising rental prices and rising home prices over the last couple of years. Um, we have not seen in salaries increase to meet that need. So I do think that there are things that we could do at the local level to help alleviate this housing crisis. We need to look at how can we further develop low-income, middle-income, and upper-income housing. This isn't just a low-income issue. Uh, it looks different when you get to each income level. Um, middle income residents are suffering through this housing crisis that's because it's unaffordable in different ways. They're shortchanging their quality of life and having increased credit card debt to help pay for housing. So they're... Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Taylor. Okay. Thank you. you know I can get started. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know y'all could speak about yeah. this all day. So uh, same question to you, Mr. Affordable Paul. housing is somewhat of a conundrum. You know, I think affordable housing does mean permanent housing and also rental housing. I think Tupelo is, uh, we've got quite a bit of rental units. We have some more that's going to be built later. Uh, and, uh, of course, the Ida B. Wells development, we, we took a chance, our council took a chance on buying that property to, to further came in that tax credit 76 units over there. I've talked to, uh, uh, it's, it's not something you can have a real easy question and fix it immediately. It's, it's going to have to be a, a public private, uh, enterprise. Uh, I talked to a real estate person and affordable housing, number one, is very difficult now because of the, uh, the price of materials. But I talked to a builder and he said, you know, buddy, if you build a $150,000, $200,000 house 
we don't make any money on it. So what they've done is 150, 200,000 is going to be a rental property. And uh, I'm very concerned about uh, rental property myself. I think we Tupelo needs to have, during the pandemic, and you guys know it. Is that no, it? that's all. Okay. I'm sorry. For years, the city has worked with Mississippi United to end homelessness or mute, which has tried to take great strides to reduce homelessness in our area. I'm curious if either of you think the city should be doing anything differently in its approach to reducing homelessness uh, in town. To be an all-American city five times and be what I call a world-class city, you have to address homelessness. And I think the city uh, has afforded a lot of money to the Salvation Army. I think that's one source. I think I was maybe the deciding vote or the one that said, if you're going to be an all-American city, we probably need to still mute which tries to take homeless people and, and uh, get them back out into society. The other part of that is, and I had a lot of people to say, uh, you know, the thing of it is, homelessness, if it doesn't affect your area, you don't think much about it. But it, when it does affect your area, or you're where you, uh, like in cities where you have businesses, it does. Thankfully, we had not had the pandering uh, in the city, but at at points in time, I've had complaints about them being up and around their properties. So uh, Hannah and her group and you, they, uh, we're going to have to address that. We'll have to address that. We cannot allow that to happen. You just can't let it. But I think Tupelo is, uh, I think Hannah will agree that uh, we're on the cutting edge just trying to help the homeless people in Tupelo. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. And I know you could talk about this all day, but uh, you have one minute. Okay. Um, well, I'll just say over the last four years, as I've been the City of Tupelo Homeless Task Force chairperson, we have made great strides to address homelessness. Not just the fact that there is homelessness, but what is causing homelessness in our community. And that is working with landlords. That's working with the justice court that adjudicates evictions. That's working with all social services that um, work with vulnerable populations to prevent homelessness as much as possible. Um, um, I will agree with Mr. Palmer, and this might be a biased statement, but I feel like Tupelo has done a fantastic job addressing homelessness over the last four, year, four years since we've had our official task force. We've reduced street homelessness by over 40% within that time frame, and that's through having a coordinated entry system. It means everybody that should be involved in this process is at the table and has equal responsibility to address homelessness. And I could not thank our Tupelo Police Department more. And I think a lot of this has been pushed by the mayor's office and by the police department in having a cohesive relationship with homeless service providers. And you do not see that in other communities. And that's because we have a police department and homeless service providers that are willing to work together. Okay. Now we'll move on to local law enforcement. The city currently has a police advisory board, uh, which is aimed to be a liaison between the community and the police department. Um, the question to both of you is, do you support the existence of the city's police advisory board? And if so, do you have any ideas to strengthen it, make it more effective, or would you change anything about uh, the current police advisory board structure? Yes, at, at the beginning of uh, the time that we... Uh, got the uh, Tupelo Police Advisory Board together. I thought it was a great idea. I still can, can consider it a great idea. Uh, I don't know, have you, are you a part of that, the advisory board? I'm not on the advisory board, but I have attended the meetings. thing of it is, these people go in there and they go through some of the training that our officers go through, and they realize what a difficult job they have. I went through there myself and as an acting police person with a simulation and a simulating a nine millimeter pistol. I got shot three times. And people don't realize they have to make decisions real quick. Uh, we have, again, I use the word world class. We have a world class training facility here in Tupelo. And I am a strong advocate of our police department. I would never, ever, ever go to defund our police department. In fact, I think we need more officers. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll turn to you. Uh, specifically about the uh, police advisory board, I it's one of the only police advisory boards of its kind in our state. So yet again, we're setting a standard, which is wonderful. Um, I'm for anything that promotes more accountability and transparency in government, regardless of program, regardless of department. So I would like to see the police advisory board have a little bit more um, oversight 
over some of the issues that have come up. Instead of just being a sounding board for the community, what solutions can actually come out of the police advisory board is what I would like to see. And I'll just kind of reiterate what Mr. Palmer said. I did attend the C Citizens Police Academy, and I was actually stabbed twice in the simulator, so I wasn't actually shot. But um, I do have, um, I would like to be a conduit, if I am elected as council person, a, like a, a good um, moderator or a good communication um, liaison between the community and the police department. Because at the end of the day, the police department, all of the city works at the, you know, behest of the community. And so we, are, we have to answer to them. One of the things the city council is tasked with is confirming or rejecting department head appointees that the mayor makes. Uh, one of those is the police chief, which uh, the mayor will have to make uh, over, the, over his next term. Uh, the question for both of you is what would your criteria be for confirming or rejecting uh, the police chief appointee or any other department head appointee that the mayor will make. Personally, just looking at any potential hire, depart regardless of department, you have to look at experience. You have to look at what is their real life experience, what's their education, what's their training. Um, I also would like to see what, how are they going to further involve the community and strengthen that relationship between the community and the police department. I also would like to know what is their stance on de-escalation training? What's their stance on bias training? All of those things that have become a part of our national conversation. I want to know how they're going to address that at a local level through our police department. So I'd like to see someone be pro-community policing, pro-training, um, and really building a, a relationship between the community and the police department. Okay, thank you very much. It's going to be one of the biggest appointees of our new mayor. And I agree with everything Hannah says. Absolutely. You've got to look at their past resume. Uh, they have to be a person that's proactive with working with their their team. Uh, they have to see things are changing now in our world. So we need to change some of the things. I would leave that up to the police uh, chief on that. And... Uh, I think that, uh, like I said, it's going to be a very important job. I think that, uh, I think Barge has done a great job, our police uh, chief, and uh, the next one would have to be proactive in trying to keep everything. Tupelo needs to be a safe place, and uh, he's got to be very pro, or she would have to be very proactive in keeping Tupelo safe and keeping us up, which I know they'll happen with the training They'll keep us up on current events and current uh, practices that they need to do or not do. Okay. Uh, the next topic is on the city's population. The latest census results show that Mississippi was only one of a handful of states that actually lost population over the past decade. Now, we do not yet have local numbers that address the population for Lee County or Tupelo, but... Uh, the question to both of you is, how do you think that you could work with the new mayoral administration on retaining the city's current population or, and even growing the city's population? Now, I did find out that Mississippi was losing population. Uh, Tupelo is getting so crowded, and like it goes back into housing. A lot of that has to do with it. That's going to have to be a, a public-private uh, op enterprise and uh, certainly with within our planning department and all of that we would certainly try to do that we need to keep more people in Tupelo but uh, if you look around Tupelo in some of the areas the uh, interstates and all run through there they're very nice neighborhoods that are outside the city so the city needs to understand that uh, we do have a, a, a competition there I mean they're great housing outside the city of Tupelo uh, Tupelo is real fortunate with our tax base and all. We, we need to encourage jobs here and uh, affordable housing. We've got to uh, we've got to come up with a remedy for that. Absolutely. Gotcha. All right. Same question to you. Uh, yeah, so um, what we're really talking about is brain drain, right? And I was a classic example of brain drain. Um, when I graduated and went to the Peace Corps, I was like, I'll never go back to Tupelo. And then I really had a change of heart over the years because I missed my family. I missed the neighborhood aspect of Tupelo. I missed the community aspect of Tupelo. And the only reason I was able to move back is because um, there was a job, a, a job was created through some funding that was released. It I had tried to, for two years to move back to Tupelo and couldn't because there were no jobs available for for my experience and for the type of work that I'm in. Um, I, that's the I think that's 
an example of many people who would love to move back to Tupelo to be close to their family members, especially after the year we've had uh, due to COVID. Uh, they just, the housing doesn't exist, the jobs don't exist, and then just the quality of life doesn't exist. They want, you know, cool local restaurants, cool local um, venues, things like that. And I know that our downtown Main Street Association has done tons of work towards that and has improved a lot of things and we have a lot of new and younger uh, business owners that are really focused on that as well but I think there's more that we could do. Now we will go on to the specific questions and uh, Councilman Palmer you've stated at previous events like the Lee County Republican Club that you believe the city should elect Republicans to local office and that and that one of the reasons is because the Republican-controlled city council has done a great job of keeping outgoing Mayor Jason Shelton, who is a Democrat, corralled and from not doing anything too drastic. Yet at other times, even earlier, you stated that the city council has done a great job at working with uh, Mayor Shelton's administration, and it's been a model for how elected officials should work together. So do you mind sort of explaining this, this discrepancy, and can you explain, if reelected, how you would work with the new mayoral administration? Well, you know, we don't know who the new mayor is. Our last uh, mayor was a Democrat. We had five Republicans, two Democrats. Uh, we, we never had any p political struggles. Uh, I'm not sure how it would have gone if we'd had a total Democratic uh, um, uh, council, but uh, you know, the mayor, when he first got in office, said there was not a Democratic or a Republican way of fixing a pothole. I agree with that. And uh, I can tell you that working with the mayor, uh, myself, uh, just speaking for myself, I think we work very well with him. I think in some things we kind of directed him. I think that you see all the results of the eight years that the mayor was here was a direct result of having two great Democrats and five great Republicans. I am a Republican. I'm a proud Republican. But I don't use politics. I don't come into this with an agenda as a council person. So that's that's my okay. thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Meharry, in previous interviews with me, you told me that if elected, one of the main things you would try to address is wage growth for citizens uh, in Tupelo. As an elected official, how would you really address this issue? Yeah, and I always take about, I talk about wage growth in relation to housing, right? Because um, I think the statistic is if someone on minimum wage would have to work over 60 hours a week at their job to afford basic housing in Tupelo. 60 hours, that means that they don't have any other time to raise their family. They don't have time to go back to school. They don't have time to go to church. They don't have a lot of time to even just live a quality, a high quality of life. So how can we um, promote wage growth at, with our local businesses in a way that they do, it's not undermining their bottom line? And I feel like there are ways that we can do that. Um, um, that includes... I always say, too, the minimum wage is a minimum. It's not a limitation. It's a minimum expectation, not a limitation. And so how can we kind of encourage our local employers to be able to pay our, our uh, workers a little bit more where they can have a higher quality of life? Because anything that you pay them more than you're now is going to go back into the local economy. They're going to spend that money on their rent. They're going to spend that money going to the grocery store, paying their bills. And so it's going to go back into the local economy. So how can we look for ways to do that? Thank you, Hannah. Okay. Uh, it is now time for the closing statements. Um, you each have two minutes for your closing statements. Uh, I think my experience as a businessman uh, would uh, warrant me a third term. I know a lot of people are big on th uh, term limits. Twelve years, I think, would be an appropriate time to have term limits. Uh, mentioning broadband a while ago and all of that, uh, I'm a member of Tom Bigby who has initiated broadband in the rural areas. I was on, I was the uh, chairman of that. And so I know very well how, how important that is. And by the way, Tom Bigby does have 55 uh, citizens in Tupelo that can be provided broadband from another source. But there are people do, in the broadband business all over. I think that's a real strong part of our infrastructure. My main asset is 
I'm a businessman. I heard Hannah speak about the council uh, kind of regulating uh, what people ought to be paid and all this. That's going to be very difficult. What you'll do, my, we're in a grocery business, and so when you start raising the minimum wage, and it's fine to do it, you, what you're going to see is a lot of prices gone. That's a real, real strong subject, and I'm not real sure that's the uh, job of a council. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Anna, you have two minutes. Yes, thank you so much. Um, what I want to focus on is um, making sure that the citizens of Tupelo that um, I'm responsible to and that I answer to as a city council person knows that I listen to them, knows that I take their their um, their issues seriously, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of neighborhood, regardless of background, regardless of any of those demographics that we uh, could list. Um, I'm a hard worker. Everything I've ever had in my whole life, I've earned. Um, I come from a single family household, and um, I I just really put a lot of emphasis on working hard and listening to people, and when they tell you what they care about, paying attention. And so, as a city council person, I would just continue that. Um, I would outwork anybody else in that council, basically. I'm not going to make a decision based off of something I think. I'm going to know it. I'm going to do the research behind the issue. I'm going to do the research into the solutions to the issue and make a very well-rounded decision on behalf of everyone in Tupelo, but especially those in Ward 5. Um, I have represented this city at the local, state, national, and international level multiple times. I'm very proud to represent the city. I'm very proud to represent my ward, and I would love to continue doing that as a city council person.